Our next speaker is Tom Vu. Tom Vu is an accomplished machine learning scientist and software innovator, adept in designing and developing elegant, scalable, and robust software solutions. Tom is currently the Senior Director and Head of Data Science and Machine Learning at Flexport. Tom's portfolio of applied research projects and interests include routing, scheduling, and assignment optimization under uncertainty, geospatial temporal forecasting, imperfect information games, natural language processing, and computer vision. Prior to Flexport, Tom was the Head of Data Science and Analytics at WeWork and the Chief Data Scientist at Boeing. Over the course of his career, Tom has identified and realized disruptive machine learning enabled opportunities resulting in the realization of over two billion in value. Tom has over 20 years of experience implementing vision, transforming unmet business opportunities into realized software solutions. Tom, over to you. Hello, um, welcome to TransformX. Uh, my name is Tom Vu and I'm here to share um, my lecture with you, which is applying machine learning effectively. Uh, my presentation is uh, focused uh, mostly on, um, on uh, uh, business leaders, um, product managers, and stuff related to machine learning. Um, and I'm gonna share with you uh, some of the stories that I have from my career of how I was able to uh, deliver a lot of uh, value in the different um, companies that I've worked at with machine learning. What I'd like to share here is um, before I go into uh, the details and some of the stories that I have to share, I'd like to, um, to start out by um, sharing um, what I think the real value of machine learning is. Um, so if you think about, about people, um, we can only store about four, roughly four to seven pieces of information in our working memory, right? Um, and that really uh, just represents the sum total of what we can remember uh, and reason over at any given time. Um, the richness of the information that we can uh, store within our memory is, is far less constrained. Um, the, uh, our, our minds can hold a lot of very dense information. Um, uh, that's not so much of a constraint, but regardless of, uh, of how dense the information is, we can roughly only think and reason over about four to seven things at, uh, at a given time. This is our cognitive, uh, our biological cognitive limitation, um, right? And um, and so if you if you think about the problems that um, that you might be looking to solve uh, within companies within uh, within uh, businesses, um, one of the things that uh, that is really important to keep in mind is um, the areas that I found to be the most fertile to 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 apply machine learning to are the opportunities that suffer from bounded rationality, and what bounded rationality is is it's the, the limitations imposed on uh, human reasoning that's based off of how complicated the problem is, how tractable the problem is, uh, combined with um, how much time you have to solve that problem. And in general, as I shared before, the actual biological limitations of, of our ability to reason through things. Um, so if you are time constrained and the problem is very difficult, it's hard to make well-reasoned decisions. And this is an area, these are opportunities that are, um, that are perfect uh, for machine learning. Um, what I have to share here, uh, my first slide, is uh, this is a picture of the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. And uh, what this is, is this is an example of one of the oldest uh, pieces of, of human writing. Um, so written language was, uh, was developed um, over 3,000 years ago. Uh, and in this particular picture, what you see here in these tables is this is uh, ancient tabulations, ancient writings that denote the harvest um, that, uh, that uh, ancient farmers had year over year. Um, and the reason why this is interesting is when a human um, writing uh, first began, uh, if you take a look at ancient Egypt, they started out with about uh, a thousand hieroglyphs. So uh, when uh, lang when written language really started to develop about 32 in about 3200 BC, 
um, there were about a thousand or so different hieroglyph, hieroglyphs, about a thousand pictographs um, by which they used to, um, to uh, express things. Uh, now the challenge of that is um, having, you know, a, an alphabet of a thousand characters, that's quite a lot, right? Um, and, 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 and that writing is complicated uh, and it takes a while for people to really learn it. Um, so what we see from about 3200 uh, BC to about 600 BC is um, we saw that how uh, we saw the evolution of writing and that evolution of writing uh, went from about a 1000 hieroglyph uh, character set um, down to about uh, 32 characters uh, in the demotic script uh, that was developed in ancient Egypt, which was the precursor to ancient Greek. Uh, now, the interesting thing about that is um, those characters that were created, uh, those 32 characters, they were basically abstracted versions of those 1000 hieroglyphs. So over time, um, the ancient Egyptians um, simplified their writing. They, they, they applied compression and abstraction. Uh, they abstracted the characters a little bit more and they combined these characters together, a sequence of these characters together to really kind of create um, the, the origins of modern language. Uh, and this is really, really interesting. Uh, and the reason why uh, this is so important is this is an example of people taking something that is uh, very uh, difficult that has high cognitive load, which is you know, memorizing different things. Uh, humans uh, started to codify and, and write those things down. Uh, and then when, when they found that that writing was too uh, complex, they basically simplified it. They came up with, it, with abstractions. Uh, based off of those ab abstractions, they, could, they combined these different abstractions together to create some of the earliest uh, norm, uh, forms of language. And, and, and uh, that written language uh, evolved into the languages that we have today, the written languages that we have today. And um, this is, you know, just some of the history of uh, early information storage, um, compression and abstraction. Um, and the reason why this is valuable is, um, you know, whereas a demotic script um, came to be around 600, uh, 600, 650 BC, um, later in the late 18th century, what you start to, what people started to see here, and a lot of the data, you data practi practitioners, um, you can identify with this, is um, this is uh, the world's very first uh, um, line graph. This is the, the very first uh, drawing uh, uh, of, uh, and, and what this does is uh, this basically graphed um, the, uh, the difference between imports and, dex and exports. Um, from Denmark and Norway to England. Uh, and this was created by William Playfair, who was an 18th century Scottish economist. Um, and he was really the father of uh, what we now know as line, area, bar, and pie charts. He created these charts. And uh, he created these charts because um, before these charts were created, it was really difficult to really understand what was going on. Um, you had um, a lot of things written down. You, of course, you had um, written numbers, um, but it's hard to really understand um, off of, you know, basically just tables of numbers, uh, what's really going on in the world. And so uh, William Playfair um, created this, uh, which basically compressed data into convenient, uh, easily understood uh, cognitive rep representations that made it a lot easier to reason about data. Um, so prior to this, um, you had to hold all of this information in your head to really make sense of things. Um, but after, uh, you know, these diagrams, these line area bar pie charts were created, it became a lot easier for people to think about and reason it, and reason uh, with data. Um, and um, this is really quite powerful, uh, especially because uh, we still use this information today. There's a lot of information uh, that is encoded within these, these diagrams. Um, that uh, you, you just you know can't get the same uh, impact that, uh, it, and, and you can't get the same type of understanding uh, if you just uh, um, wrote things down and if you just took a look at numbers. Uh, so this happened in the uh, late 18th century. And around the turn of the century, what I have here is I have a picture of uh, uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Now, uh, Taylor, 
was an industrial laborer and he was a machinist uh, who was really one of the first people in the world to really apply the principles of data collection, um, scientific analysis, and optimization to uh, the work of human labor, of, of uh, industrial production, right? Uh, he's really uh, um, thought of as kind of the father of, uh, of um, industrial engineering and, and really of business management. And what he did was he basically took a look at uh, different production processes. He took a look you know, on a particular assembly line, what did people do, how did they do it? And he started to measure that type of uh, productivity. Uh, he started to analyze uh, the different approaches that people took to doing things. And he, he broke those apart. He reduced those into, uh, into smaller pieces. And, um, and then he, he thought of, hey, if I'm gonna reduce these into individual pieces that I'm gonna measure, can I come up with a better way of, 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 of doing something, right? Uh, can I analyze this? Can I improve it? Uh, can I make the process repeatable? Um, and uh, this really resulted in a tremendous amount of uh, gains in efficiency and quality of industrial production, right? And so uh, what Taylor did was he, uh, is he started to measure things, uh, create a lot of graphs, in charts uh, and, and applied analysis to understand what was going on. And, and through that reasoning and that analysis process, really worked to optimize it. And um, he's, a, he's a, a key individual who's, um, who's responsible for really bringing about um, the, uh, the, uh, the industrial world in the 20th century that we've all benefited from, right? Um, and now um, I'm going to share with you a chart. And this chart basically depicts the cost of data storage. And this is where things get really interesting uh, because data storage here uh, on the left hand side, um, I have uh, some data points from 1975. It took about a million dollars to store a gigabyte worth of data in 1975. Um, and that price came down from about a million dollars in 1975 to less than a penny around 2019. And today, if you think about it, the cost of data storage is practically free. And not only is the, is the cost of data storage free, but because the cost of data storage has gone down so significantly, um, what we've seen is we've seen people come up with very interesting ways to fill up that data storage because the cost of data storage has gone down so dramatically uh, what we've experienced in, uh, in this recent uh, decade is that we've seen a near exponential increase in the amount of data stored on the internet, right? In, uh, in 2019, uh, roughly 500 hours of video content um, were uploaded to YouTube every minute, right? And so um, the world that we're living in now is a world that's really, really different um, you know, uh, from, uh, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution of the 20th century. Uh, and because of that, a lot of the tools and a lot of the analyses that were used in the past cannot, be, uh, cannot really be applied uh, in the same way today. Um, because uh, as we collect a lot of data, we collect a lot of data with passive sensors, we collect a lot of data in, in passively uh, with, with, with camera feeds, um, uh, you know, if, if we wanted to analyze that data and make sense of that data, um, it's, it's, it's impossible. It's completely intractable um, because with an exponentially increasing corpora of information that gets created, um, making sense of that with charts and graphs um, is very difficult, right? We, we'd really be drowning within it uh, because as a Turing Award winner, uh, Herbert Simon put it, a wealth of information creates a scare, scarcity of attention. And um, in my particular career, um, I really started to see this uh, come about in the uh, early 2010s. And, um, and, and, I, and I came up with, with a quote for myself, uh, which is, um, I think in an information rich world, it's easy to drown in information while thirsting for knowledge. Uh, because here's a story I'd like to share with you. Um, in a previous job that I worked with, uh, one of the challenges that I was looking to do is I was looking to help the company that I work with um, really kind of improve um, uh, improve 
uh, their their cost efficiency uh, of of manufacturing. Um, I worked at a big industrial company, and one of the challenges that that the company had uh, was that um, uh, it produced a bunch of industrial products, and um, uh, as such, there were a lot of parts that were required to basically support these uh, su support uh, the manufacturing process. Um, but it was very difficult and it was very expensive uh, to get a lot of these um, these uh, contracts for the, for these parts um, um, like signed. Um, and the reason why is the suppliers uh, for this particular company really knew that the longer that you wait, um, the longer that you drag out a contract negotiation process, um, the more um, desperate the company will be to basically sign that particular contract, right? They're, they're going to um, give better terms uh, to, uh, to make sure that production is, is not affected. Um, and um, and uh, it was hard for that particular company um, to uh, get um, parts on contract in a timely manner. Uh, and, and so, uh, and the reason why that, that was the case is because there was a lot of parts that uh, this particular company um, had to procure. Um, and uh, these parts are actually very, were very complicated. And uh, the procurement agents who were responsible for getting these parts on contract um, were overwhelmed um, with the complexity uh, of the information and the volume of, of parts that they were tasked with, uh, with getting on contract, right? And, um, and, and this was a challenge because if, you, if these procurement agents are not really able to understand what's going on, if they're basically just giving a, a set of a list of, of, of uh, parts and tasks to go after, um, and, um, and uh, they don't really understand uh, or, or, can, or can spend enough time um, to really process what it is that, that they're trying to do, um, you know, they are basically uh, susceptible uh, to being um, really kind of uh, taken advantage of by some of the suppliers. So one of the one of the things that that I did, that my team did, was um, we created some interesting machine learning algorithms. And the algorithms that we created was we could we could take on on one end um, like uh, designs of uh, complicated designs of parts. And on the other side, uh, we could basically uh, calculate um, the um, the price, the the cost that it would take to to manufacture these particular parts, right? And that's uh, really quite powerful because if you can uh, if you can take the design of a complicated uh, piece of machinery, and um, you can start to predict how much it would cost to manufacture that. Um, then you get a really good cost basis uh, of, uh, of a particular part. And um, you can go and, and, and identify the amount of margin that you're willing to see for that particular part. Uh, and so what I had applied uh, during that project is I was able to take a lot of uh, computer uh, um, um, CAD drawings for industrial uh, parts, industrial machines, uh, run that in a series of algorithms that would compute that particular cost. And once that cost was computed and once that cost was rationalized, um, because uh, to support that, you know, we, we can break down um, that work into, uh, hey, uh, this is the reason why this part costs uh, the way it does and as much as it does. Um, by using that, uh, it was we were able to, um, to give some of the procurement agents that were supporting these processes, um, we were able to get them the ammunition that they would need to negotiate favorable prices for those particular parts. And as a result of that, bring the, the cost, production cost, down quite significantly. Um, and um, and, and uh, the story that I'm telling you um, is valuable because uh, what I did um, to, to make this work was I really took a look at what the processes existed uh, at a particular company, uh, where the pain points were, and the pain points that I identified were really related to cognitive load. 
Um, there were a lot of people who were in charge of very important decisions um, that were quite frankly overwhelmed by the amount of information um, that they had to digest. And um, they were also um, um, greatly stressed by the amount of time that they were giving to complete some of these tasks. And so to alleviate that, uh, I was able to create some, uh, some uh, machine learning models to greatly simplify that task for them by taking a bunch of raw information. Uh, and the raw information that I took were really information about um, the design of a particular par part or, or design of, of, of a particular component, um, quantify the basis cost of that particular design, given a bunch of inputs, um, like uh, you know, the amount of labor required, the amount of machinery required to fabricate these things, and uh, on one end, and on the other end, um, to really rationalize and compute um, what those costs were. Uh, and um, that's an example that, that I, I, I'd share with you today of, of how, uh, within my career, I was able to um, create a lot of impact and a lot of value by focusing on uh, alleviating um, the, uh, the areas within workflow and, and, and within processes that are mentally taxing. And this is an area of machine learning that I don't think a lot of people pay much attention to. And I don't think they, they pay that much attention to that because um, uh, within this field, uh, we're always looking uh, to chase the next cool thing the next big thing, there's been a lot of incredible advances in recent years related to natural language processing, computer vision, and within this last year in 2022, kind of the fusion of those things um, with, uh, with like, for example, OpenAI's uh, Dolly mo model. Um, there's a lot of interest in that area. But for those of us who uh, actually practice machine learning uh, in other industries, uh, where we're solving other problems that are not specifically related to NLP or computer vision. Um, my personal experience is that um, you can create a lot of value uh, and, and the areas uh, of ripe opportunity for machine learning really lie at the areas where cognitive load is taxing for people. Uh, and so that's what I'd just like to share with you today is um, I'd like to share with you um, some of my experiences, um, some of the things that I've seen, um, why it is so important to, to create uh, solutions that will uh, simplify and, um, and, and, and make human reasoning um, a lot more effective and efficient. Um, so uh, that's, what I, that's the stories that I had to share with you today. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, TransformX. Thank you. Bye-bye.